Tonight, a KQED Newsroom special focusing on the power of mothers to change the world. And so I grew up knowing mothers are powerful, mothers are influential, their role is essential. We hear from Anna Malaika and Michael Tubbs on the mothers that shaped their lives and the lives of some of our nation's most revolutionary leaders. And we discuss the landmark book, Diet for a Small Planet, updated by mother and daughter team, Anna and Francis Moore LaPay. What we eat, what we put in our bodies is of course central to our own health, but it's also really a key part of our planetary health. Plus, Reshma Sojani wants to build a social movement that gives mothers their due through support systems like paying moms for their critical work as caregivers. Hello and welcome to a special edition of KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. How do we, as a society, value the work that our mothers provide? In today's show, we're looking back at several of our interviews featuring authors who have highlighted the work of mothers. We begin with husband and wife, Michael and Anna Malika Tubbs. When former Stockton mayor Michael Tubbs was just a child, his father went to prison and he was raised by three women, his mother, aunt, and grandmother. He writes about their influence in his book, The Deeper the Roots. His wife, author and scholar Anna Malika Tubbs, tackles motherhood too in her book, The Three Mothers, how the mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin shaped a nation. The two speak candidly about how mothers are often overlooked and how it is beyond time to shine a light on their power. Anna and Michael, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. I appreciate it. Well, let's turn a little bit to your work, which is about highlighting and bringing up the profiles of women and of mothers in particular. Um, Anna, this was your doctoral dissertation that you turned into your debut book, yeah. which has done extremely well, and it's a fascinating read. Tell thank me you. a little bit about how you chose this subject of mothers and the mothers of these particular three people. Yeah, first and foremost, I have to say I had an incredible mother who was a lawyer that advocated for women's rights, both in the US as well as abroad. and. Everywhere that we lived, she told me to pay attention to how mothers were being treated in each society, that if mothers were treated well, that society would do well, and if they weren't, that that society wouldn't be able to accomplish whatever goals that they had. And so when I started my PhD, I wanted to do something that honored mothers. I narrowed it down to these three mothers in particular because, um, one, they were all born within six years of each other, Alberta King. Bertus Baldwin and Louise Little. Um, and then their famous sons were all born within five years of each other. What should we know? What should we learn? It's a full book, you can't get into everything. But if there's something you'd like to share with our audience. I'll just give be? little teasers for those who haven't read the book mm -hmm. about one thing with each woman that we should have known mm. that'll allow us to kind of feel that sense of shock that I felt doing this research. The book was 90% my original research. Um, so this was not information that was available to us before. Mm -hmm. If you tried to search these women, you would come up very short on finding anything about them. Uh, first, with Alberta Williams King, MLK Jr.'s mother, we knew in our history that MLK Sr., of course, was a pastor, and we all assumed that this is kind of where he inherited all of his gifts from, that MLK Jr. inherited it from his father. But in fact, it was actually Alberta's parents who established Ebenezer Baptist Church, who raised her to believe that Christian faith was always intertwined with social justice. She participated in marches and in boycotts. And in fact, when she got married, her husband moved in with her. This was a family of influence. We should all know that. That's a part of our American history, our world history. With Bertus Baldwin, James Baldwin's mother, she was a writer herself. She believed that you could change other people's perspectives on what was happening in the world through the power of words. And so she would gift letters to her loved ones, showing them the way to the light, to finding love, to finding healing, even in the darkest of times. And that is very much what James Baldwin did <laughs> for the entire world. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about Malcolm X and his mother, Louise Little. She was a radical activist, a proud Garveyite, a black nationalist. Mm -hmm. Long before her children were even a thought in her mind. She was writing for the Negro World newspaper, putting her name in writing saying, I will stand up for myself.
myself and for my people by any means necessary. This was Luis Little, and this is also what we celebrate and love Malcolm X for. We should have known long before my book that they were following in their mother's footsteps. Let's turn to your book now, Michael, which also celebrates three mothers from a very personal point of uh, view. This is your own three mothers, your birth mother, your aunt, and your grandmother. Tell us about their influence in your life and how they shaped you. Yeah, I, I appreciate sort of my mom, my aunts, and my grandmother more and more as I get older because I realize they are so regular, so mm. ordinary, and, and just like uh, people you meet at the grocery store, people you meet at church, but really instill strong values. They always taught myself and my cousins and my brother that we weren't better than people, but no one was better than us. Mm -hmm. They were very clear from early on that I was worth fighting for. So every time I got kicked out of class, every time I thought someone was treating me unfairly, whether it was a basketball coach or a teacher, they would take off work and be in the classroom, sit down with me, meet with mm -hmm. every time, mm -hmm. even when I was mm -hmm. wrong. And that mm -hmm. taught me early on, like, wow, I'm worth fighting for. They also taught me about service. Like, I didn't know there was a name for it. We were, there were time, I remember actually being hungry and having to pass mm -hmm. out food, and then we would eat after. Or going to the convalescent hospital every month with my grandmother to talk to the folks who were, who were in there and, and realizing that without giving any lectures, without giving any speeches, they were teaching me what it meant to be a good person and what it meant to be a leader, and that's to serve. Michael, you've advocated for universal basic income, and you ran a pilot project in Stockton. Tell us about what your findings were in terms of the value of supporting mothers financially, or supporting mm -hmm. women. Well, what was interesting about the Stockton pilot was that 75% of all the recipients were women. Mm -hmm. And not because we selected women, we just sent mail to addresses, but families selected the mother, usually of the house, to be the one to receive the income and, and the money. And what we saw was that it allowed folks to go to work. So those who received the guaranteed income were two times more likely to go from a part-time to a full-time job than those who didn't. And also those who received the guaranteed income were two times less likely to be unemployed. We saw that the money was spent on essentials, on utilities, on childcare, on things that kids need, on school clothes, et cetera. And we also saw health impacts, that people's stress and cortisol levels actually were lowered because they weren't anxious about money and anxious mm -hmm. about paying bills. Would you share with us a little bit about the experience that you have of raising black children? Mm. The fears that come with that, the need to teach them to be brave yeah. and to be open and to be open-hearted. How, how do you think about that? How are you addressing that uh, with these yeah. very little humans that you have right now? <laughs> I mean, they're how old? Two One and, and two? Two and a half. Two and a half and an our eight months old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for me and my study of black motherhood and how I think about our parenting, there's four tenets to it. The first is that we don't have a choice as to whether or not we're gonna tell our children how ugly this world can be. Um, we have to tell them about things like white supremacy. We have to tell them how hard it can be out there. We have to prepare them. But the second part of it is that we can't allow them to be defined by that. We need them to know that they are a part of changing this world and not only can they, but that they should. Um, but thirdly, that it's not all on their shoulders. We educate them about all those who came before them, their family members, our strategies for addressing this, what we have done in our own lives, inviting them to join us in this team. It's not all just on their shoulders. And the fourth one being that their joy, their love, their relaxation are just as important as the fight. Mm -hmm. um, it's really the most important tool, truly, that we maintain our sense of humanity and the fact that we get to also be happy here mm -hmm. while we're fighting for more freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's my kind of four tenet plan um, and we kind of do that in, in different ways. Michael, for you as you're raising the kids, what are your thoughts? Do you have specific fears um, and concerns that you're working to address with them? Yeah, I, I think building on the four point plan as <laughs> are articulated, um, and I think just want to emphasize the point around joy too, like be happy, live, because I, I recognize as I get older one of the most insidious things that white supremacy does is it dehumanizes mm, and it causes strips you, that joy away. Yeah, it causes you either to be superhuman, to, to, to compensate for what people may think of you, or it causes people to treat you as less than human, as if your life has no value. And mm. I think uh, what a big part of our strategy is for them to know that they, it's, it's beautiful to be black. They're walking in a legacy yeah. of mm -hmm. folks who have been excellent, who have helped shape cultures, change nations, change the world, and that they're human. And part of the, the human experience is joy and laughter and learning, um, and that there always will be supported. 
Michael and Dr. Anna Malika Tubbs, <laughs> thank you both for joining us thank today. You. Thank you for having us. Next up, Anna LaPay is an expert in the field of climate change, in particular, how our food plays a significant role in a warming planet. LaPay is also the daughter of Francis Moore LaPay, who wrote the revolutionary book, Diet for a Small Planet, 50 years ago, which drew a connection between what we eat and climate change. Now, Anna has updated her mother's book and its increasingly urgent call to action. So Anna, thank you for joining us here in studio. Well, it's really fun to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, I have the book here, Diet for a Small Planet. It is revolutionary the first time around. What is different between this edition and the original? Well, in a lot of ways, a lot of it's the same. So this is the 50th anniversary edition of the book. And so much of what my mother was saying 50 years ago is still true today, which is that what we eat, what we put in our bodies is of course central to our own health, but it's also really a key part of our planetary health. And now we see how much of an impact our food systems is having on climate change. Uh, but what is new in this book is a new introductory chapter from my mother that sort of ties five decades of her thinking together mm. and helps tell the stories of many of the social movements around the world that are working to make food that's better for our bodies and better for the planet. And then the recipe section, which is about half the book, has been totally revamped for the 21st century and has uh, a, a several, a bunch of new recipes actually. And then all of the, the recipes in there have been tweaked in some way. And you've got Alice's Creamy Meyer Lemon Dressing, which is from Alice Waters. You've got Betty the Peacenicks Gingerbread. Do you have a favorite recipe here? Well, asking for my favorite recipe is like asking for my favorite child. But I will say what pops into my mind as like great comfort food is another one of our celebrity chef recipes from my friend and local incredible chef, Bryant Terry, mm -hmm. and he has a great recipe for braised collard greens mm -hmm. that I like to serve with cornbread, and uh, it's a big hit in my family. Sounds great. I do want to check in about your mom and see how she's doing because she is, she's still a powerhouse. <laughs> yeah, so I was just actually talking with her this morning and we realized she has done, she and then some of uh, we have done 50 events for this 50th anniversary already since it came out just a month ago. And I was teasing her that she's sort of the poster child of this plant-centered diet mm -hmm. that we celebrate in the book because she has so much energy and so much joy that she brings to the work mm -hmm. and she's still going strong at 78. And she's about to get her 20th honorary degree. Yes, so 20th book, 20th honorary degree. Wow, all right. I wanna read a quote from the new edition here. And it says, even if the world immediately cut all fossil fuel emissions for energy, food systems emissions alone would make it impossible to meet the targets for limiting global warming set in the 2015 Paris Agreement. And your point here is that the food system is responsible for 37% of our emissions, so it's not enough to just focus on fossil fuels. Can you unpack this a little more for exactly. us? Exactly, I certainly wouldn't want anybody listening for to hear me and think that I mean, let's not worry about the oil and gas or transportation or mm -hmm. buildings. I'm saying that if we are going to solve this crisis, every single sector has to step up, mm -hmm. and food and agriculture in particular, because as you say, it's more than a third of all emissions. So that's one of the messages that we hope people hear from us. So when we look at the past 50 years, some things have changed, right? I mean, I think we generally are more accepting of this concept of the importance of whole foods and of eating more plant-centered diets. And we see the problems with aggressive for farming. But there's still, unfortunately, this incredible environmental degradation because of our food system. And in many ways, we're in a worse place than we were 50 years ago. So what is it, do you think, that's keeping us as a society from adopting the principles that are in this book? Mm -hmm. Well, you really put your finger on it, that we're living in this both and time, that we both know so much more about what a healthy diet looks like. And it looks like centering plants on our plate. And it looks like trying to do what we can to get chemicals out of farming uh, to adopt practices that are better for soils, for instance, all those things we know we need to do. And there's there's a lot of popular acceptance for that way of eating. So why don't we see more change? And I think our political system is beholden to corporate interests that are really powerful. And uh, the fact that there are now more agribusiness lobbyists on Capitol Hill than there are lobbyists for the oil and gas industry, to me is just one signal of just how much influence uh, corporate power has in terms of the policies that we need to pass the kinds of regulations we would need to pass to really shift systems.
Right, so that's a follow the money, right? Where are we putting our money and what does that show about our values? There is so much power that states have, particularly a state like California, right? Huge agricultural producer and huge economy. And it's been really encouraging to see that the state has actually passed some really good policies and put money behind some of the kinds of policies we need to help farmers make this transition away from a really fossil fuel dependent way of farming mm -hmm. to one that's better for the environment, better for communities. And so, for instance, uh, we're seeing for the first time $100 million dedicated to farmworker housing that will help those workers be protected better for climate shocks. We're seeing tens of millions of dollars to help farmers transition to organic farming in the state. We're seeing millions going to healthy soils programs. It's really encouraging. There is a lot of, uh, you know, existential dread when it comes to climate change and it comes to the environment overall. And yet there's a word that pops up over and over again in your mother's writing and in the books you've authored, and that's hope. You wrote a book called Hope's Edge. Can you tell us about that strength of hope, the need for hope at this time, and how you yourself find that hope and keep moving forward? Yeah, um, what my mother and I have come to realize about hope is that it's really a source of energy that comes from taking action and, and being part of trying to make the change that you want to see in the world, that it, it comes from our sense of possibility that is grounded in the evidence we've seen as researchers. We, my mother and I have traveled around the world and we have met such incredible social movement leaders, incredible city government leaders, incredible people in the media who have made change possible up against the biggest odds you could possibly imagine. And those people have taught us to be what we call ourselves now, uh, possibilists. Hmm. So we're not optimists, mm -hmm. we're not pessimists. Either one of those kind of presumes a kind of hubris about the future you think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. We are possibilists. And it's from that sense of possibility that I get my hope. And it's from being part, even if it's a small part, but feeling like I'm part of trying to create the world that I wanna see for my children. Anna, thank you for joining us in studio and thank you for bringing this message of hope. Well, thanks for having me. We've spoken before on this show about the she session that occurred during the pandemic. The term refers to the large number of women who left the workplace in the past two years, often due to the lack of childcare and other support as COVID shut down schools and daycare centers. Author Rashma Sojani says it's time for change. So Johnny is the founder of the nonprofit Girls Who Code and the author of a new book titled Pay Up, The Future of Women and Work. In her book, she argues that we need to redefine work and the value we place on the invisible labor women do for their families and communities. Labor that she notes holds our economy and social fabric together. Reshma Sojani joins us now. Reshma, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So a little background, how'd you become an activist for girls and women? Was there kind of a specific moment or experience that gave you this drive? I totally blame my dad. Mm. You know, my parents came here as refugees in, in 1973 from Uganda. And even though they were both engineers, my father worked as a machinist in the plant. My mother sold cosmetic. And no matter how tired my dad was, he would read to me these little Reader's Digest books about Dr. King and Mahatma Gandhi. And so I knew from the time I was 13 that I wanted to make a difference in the world. One of the things you did early on is you founded and ran an organization called Girls Who Code, and that's educated 300,000 girls. You recently stepped down from direct leadership, but you are the chair of the board. So tell us more about the impact of that organization, which operates here in California as well. Yes, we have tons of chapters here uh, in California. I started the organization in you know early 2011, uh, at that time, you know, we had a huge pipeline problem. Less than 18% of those that were going into the technology workforce was female. And if you talk to any engineer or any CEO, they'd say my number one problem is I can't find enough, you know, technical talent. And so I started Girls Who Code just to say, well, what if you taught 20 girls to code and you put them inside a conference room, you know, in Silicon Valley, you know, what could happen? Could you ignite their interest in computer science? And the answer almost now 10 years later is yes, we've taught over 450,000 girls to code. We've reached half a billion girls through our work. And when you go to any single college campus and you look, you go into their computer science department or their engineering department, whether it's Berkeley, you know, whether it's, you know, Carnegie Mellon, Harvard, MIT, half the girls graduating now are women. And you see far more Latina and black girls than you've ever had before.
let's turn a little bit. You're running your company. You've had even a Super Bowl ad by the skincare brand Olay, which raised money for girls who code. You've had success after success, and then the pandemic hit. And you share a moment early in the book that I think a lot of us women can relate to. It's the early days of the pandemic. You've been caring for your infant child and your older five-year-old son. You've been handling all the household responsibilities. You've been running your own business. You're exhausted, and you basically lay down on the floor in your kid's room with a Lego stuck under your cheek, and you you just don't know if you can get up. And yet, as you point out, you're one of the lucky ones with a partner and a steady income. How did that moment sort of do in terms of inspiring you for change, in terms of motivating you? It made me realize that so much of what I've been saying is wrong. You know, mm -hmm. I spent the past 10 years telling girls to barnstorm the corner office, to lean in real hard, to girl boss their way to the top. And I'll, I found myself in the pandemic with two little kids running an organization, and I barely made it. And I learned the hard way that having it all, it's just a euphemism for doing it all. And that we have to stop saying that all we have to do is color code our calendar and delegate more and find a mentor or a sponsor. We have to stop trying to fix the woman and fix the structure. You know, and shortly after that, you wrote an op-ed that went viral. And in it, you yeah. called for a Marshall Plan for Mothers. Tell us about the reason you named it that and the basic problem that you're calling out here. Because it felt like World War II, burned out cities. And when we started COVID-19, we were 51% of the labor force. We were flying our feminist flags high. And then within nine months, gone. You know, we're back to where we were in 1989. It terrified me. And when I looked around, I said, where's the plan? Why is the president talking about this? Why isn't Congress talking about this? Why isn't every single CEO of a Fortune 500 company talking about this? And when I talked to the moms of my PTA, we knew exactly what needed to change. We needed paid leave. We needed affordable childcare. We needed schools to open up safely. We needed cash payments for all the unpaid labor that we were doing. And women who had lost their jobs because they were in jobs that weren't pandemic proof needed to be retrained. It wasn't that complicated. The reality is, is that for far too long, America's mothers have been America's social safety net. And now two years later, women are still in crisis. Millions of us are still missing from the labor force. Millions of us have downshifted our career. 51% of moms say that they're anxious and depressed. The CDC reported that the, you know, the largest subgroup that's facing anxiety and depression post pandemic is moms. Mm. Moms don't break. And guess what? We're broken. You're very clear in this book that this isn't a problem that can be solved at the individual level by women sort of leaning in or trying harder. So talk about the broad range of solutions that you're proposing. Yeah, I lay out nine strategies in my book, Pay Up, and I'll, I'll talk about three. You know, the first one is, is really um, subsidizing childcare. You know, childcare is an economic issue. It's not your personal problem that you have to fix. You talk to any family and their childcare cost is the largest cost center of a family. If you don't have childcare, you can't work. Already, many of the companies in California, they're subsidizing and paying for your IVF, but when you become a mother, the support ends. And the reality is, is the cost of childcare is cheaper than the cost of attrition. And the reason why we're in the middle of a great resignation right now and that 4 million people are leaving every single month, it's not because they don't want to work. They don't want to work for you and they wanna work for a place that values their family, whether it's their children or their elderly parents. You know, the second thing is, is we have to have a fundamentally different conversation than are we returning to work or not returning to work. We have to stop finding flexibility in remote working and start thinking about design. Like for example, why is the school day eight to three and the work day nine mm -hmm. to five? It's because workplaces were designed for a man who had a stay at home partner. The reality is in America, most, most of like 90% of two, two parents work. Everybody has to work. There is no one to stay at home and take care of the kids. And so we have to design a workplace that allows for flexibility, that allows for predictability so that we can do caretaking. We don't have to choose between being a mom and having a job. And finally, we got to have a conversation around mental health. I mean, we are in extreme burnout. I am in extreme burnout. And, and, and the reality is, is like we have to be valued for more than just our output. Stop just having performance reviews, have wellness reviews. Ask people how they're doing, ask people what they need. Obviously there are political and regulatory implications of what you're suggesting. You know, recently Congress allowed the extended child tax credit to expire. 
and Senator Joe Manchin has insisted that any such government help needs to be linked to work income. What sort of message is that sending? It's shameful that Congress is bailing out airlines, but they won't bail out moms. And the reality is, is Joe Manchin doesn't know what it, the definition of a, of a working mother. You know, the, the unpaid labor that women do, the domestic work, the child caring, the schooling, the buying the shoes and figuring out where the diaper bag is, all of that is work. In fact, it's two and a half jobs. And so we have to stop, you know, stop talking about it the way that we've typically talked about it in this country, that you're only entitled to a child tax credit if you're working in the workforce. Uh, and we have to start valuing unpaid labor that so many women do. There's a piece that you're talking about here that is not about the policies or the regulations straight up. It's about the way that we in our society see women and the work that women do. One of the most controversial pieces of your plan was the suggestion to pay $2,400 a month to mothers. Tell us about that and why you think that's important. Whew, people really get mad about that because the reality is I wanted to have a conversation. Why does it ignite so much anger? This idea that we should be paying women for their unpaid labor. Why is it so hard for us to see that labor as work? You know, part of it is, is that so many feminists, you know, thought about equality as just equality in the workplace. The point of getting women's participation is to get them to work in the workplace. I think equality means giving women the choice, you know, to move in and out of the workforce without penalty. You know, we look at single, you know, at women who stay at home with disdain. Why? You know, every person should be able to choose. If you want to stay home with your kids for a year, two, 10 years, forever, that is your choice. And we should live in a society where we see that as valuable. Author and activist Reshma Sojani, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. We've heard today about mothers who have influenced civil, environmental, and social movements, as well as those who influenced our individual lives. I'm fortunate that my own mother has been a guide and change maker in my life. What about you? We'd love to hear about your mom and what she's meant to you, or get your thoughts on the role of mothers in our world. You can email us at knr at kqed.org. KQED Newsroom is also online and on Twitter, and you can reach me on social media at Priya D. Clemens. And that's the end of our show for tonight. We thank you for joining us. We'll see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend.